Thank you all so much for being here. Um, it is an honor to have an audience, to be able to talk about one's work, um, and I, I, never, I never take that for granted. So I'm, I'm really, I really feel privileged to be here. Um, you know, most of us woke up this morning to hearing about what happened in Las Vegas last night. And we don't know, you know, many of the details about the person who perpetrated this incredibly violent act. Uh, but we do know that a lot of the time, these things are somehow wrapped up in sexuality. Um, Elliot Roger, for example, he is the man who opened fire on the campus of UC Santa Barbara not too long ago because he felt like he was being denied access, sexual access to women that he felt entitled to. Um, Omar Mateen recently opened fire in a, a gay, a largely Latino nightclub, um, perhaps out of some sort of frustration or, or anger about the kind of sexuality that was being expressed there. And uh, we know, for example, that Dylan Roof, who opened fire uh, in, in, a, in a church and killed black, black people of faith, um, he, he did that, um, he argued, in order to protect and save white women who he thought belonged to him and were his responsibility. So um, all too often, these mass, mass and, and individual acts of violence have to do with sexuality. And it, as a sexuality researcher, I, it's easy for me to sometimes lose, maybe that's funny to say, but lose track of that fact. You know, with so many big changes in our world and so many things like what happened in Las Vegas last night, I think, gosh, what could be less important than college kids' orgasms? <laughs> um, but then I remember, you know, that sexuality is a place where the best things about the world and the worst things about the world are all found. It's a microcosm for everything in our society. And so we can study sexuality and we can see, sometimes with great clarity, uh, what's going on in our society. And so that's kind of how I see it. And that's, that's how I saw this study as well. And I think we'll come back around to that in the end. Um, but for now, let's get started with, uh, with American Hookup. <coughs> So I start the book with the experience of a student I named Owen. He is a nice looking guy. Um, he told me he was shy and nerdy, but that he cleaned up pretty well. Um, he'd gone to a very small high school of only about 60 students total. So there was very little sexual experimentation in high school because everyone knew each other and it was too much like being in a goldfish bowl. Um, and so he was really excited to go to college where he would have a lot more access to a lot more sexual partners. And um, at first, it was everything he hoped it would be. He was extremely excited. He, he saw women everywhere that he wanted to uh, potentially be sexual with. Um, and so referring to the first semester of college, this is what he said. And um, is it OK if I curse a little bit? OK. OK. <laughs> So he says, uh, about his first semester, he says, I'm basically in a paradise full of girls I'm attracted to. I love it here. Everyone is fucking each other. Last semester was one of the most interesting, exciting, and strangest times of my life. And then, um, over the course of his second semester, his excitement starts to wane. He complains about mind games, about soured friendships, about women that seem to like him only for his looks or for his weed. Uh, he <laughs> Uh, he hates the gossip that follows sexual encounters, and he starts to get kind of mor morose. And somewhere into his second semester, he says, a lot of the social life I've experienced is some sort of twisted, sort of self-perpetuating, vicious cycle of unrealistic expectations, boundless enthusiasm, and copious amounts of alcohol. Uh, he felt like there was something particularly difficult about negotiating a sexual relationship. Um, grumbling that he found it difficult to smooth out uh, some sort of friendship afterward with a woman that he, that he knew barely beyond what color underwear she wore. By the end of the semester, he sounded downright morbid. He said, when I think about my sex life, it, ties, it feels like my insides tie themselves tight together. I, can, I can't handle another negative sexual relationship. My heart might break. And that, at that point, he decides that he's not going to pursue any more sexual encounters. Uh, and and I, I'm not sure what happened in the previous years, but that's, or the, the years after that, but that is what he decided. So um, 
in some way, Owen's experience captures a contradiction that drove me to, to want to study this topic. On the one hand, most students are really interested in casual sexual encounters in college. Most students that are coming right out of high school or soon out of high school, they, they know that college has a reputation for that, and they're, they're eager, if nervous, about what they might encounter when they get there. But we also know that most students don't actually end up having a very good time with sex and dating and relationships on college campuses. We know about 15 to 25% of them think it's great. Um, and then 75 to 85% are ambivalent at best about what's going on. And so I wanted to know what happened to make that change. Why, why was there so much enthusiasm going in and then so little uh, excitement about what actually happened? So what I did um, is I decided to uh, look at students as they passed through their freshman year. I, I had 101 students uh, basically write a diary, and they submitted their diary to me every Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, letting me know what happened to them that week. I did that for a semester, and I got all kinds of narratives and experiences that students were having. So. Um, I did this three times over a few years at two colleges. One was a religiously affiliated and one a secular college. I collected over a million words from these 101 students. So I got a lot of data from them about what was going on. Uh, they were a really diverse group. 22 were from working class or poor, poor backgrounds. 45 of them were students of color. Pretty well balanced between Latino, Asian, and African American students. Uh, 19 identified as a sexual minority or were questioning their sexual orientation. I mix all of these students throughout the whole book, um, understanding that they all represent um, the sort of diverse experiences of students. And because I got to know them so well in those million words, it was, I saw them all very much as individuals, and they all experienced the sexual culture in a really different way. Uh, in addition to these diaries, I traveled to speak, I think at the, at the time it had been like at 25 different colleges and universities. Now it's been closer to 60 colleges and universities. And when I went to speak, I would ask students what was going on and try to get as much information from them as I could, doing lots of focus groups and one-on-ones. Um, I read hundreds of first-hand accounts of hookup culture in college newspapers, uh, which was really interesting. Um, I did follow-up interviews also with 21 of the students who were had graduated, and I asked them how the next three years go. Uh, and then I brought my own research into dialogue with the existing research, which, which by now is thousands of articles about hookup culture, including uh, one quantitative data set that has over 24,000 students in it from 21 institutions. So we actually know a lot about hookup culture on college campuses, however creepy that might sound. Um, so what I discovered was that it wasn't the hookup per se that was um, behind negative experiences like Owen's, not necessarily. Um, in fact, w one thing we have learned is that the average student isn't really hooking up that much. Uh, there's only about 10% of students that will hook up, say, 10 times or more in their four years of college. So there's a, a, a small minority that's hooking up a lot, but the rest of the students are hooking up just occasionally, just every once in a while, or um, they hook up a lot right at the very beginning of college. I mean, like, before classes start during orientation is when it starts. <laughs> and uh, then it kind of dwindles out as y'all get busy during the semester. Pops back up again at the beginning of second semester when everyone's back, you know, and we're having parties again. Um, and then it kind of goes like this through the whole four years. It's like a little pop pops up at the beginning of semesters, but overall declines. Um, so a lot of those hookups are happening right at the beginning. People tend to lose enthusiasm. Uh, so I figured, well, it can't really be the hookup that's causing all of these problems if the hookup isn't even that common on college campuses. And what I decided was that, that the problem was hookup culture. There was something about the culture that everyone had to interact with, whether they were hooking up or how much they were hooking up. Uh, that was where the problem was. And so what I want to talk about today is what is a hookup culture? Um, how did it get here? Why do we have hookup cultures on college campuses? How do students respond to it? And then who cares? Like, is this something we should really be worried about? So um, to begin, so if hooking up is a, is a casual sexual encounter, 
students will say that it involves anything from making out to um, any sort of advanced sexual activities. Uh, so there's very am ambiguous content. Um, but there's one thing about the hook hooking up that seems to be true no matter what, which is that you're not supposed to be doing it for any romantic intention. So it's supposed to be decidedly non-romantic and casual. Um, and there's a difference between campuses in which there is hooking up and campuses on which there's a hookup culture. There has always been hooking up. There was hooking up before you were born. There was hooking up um, before women went to college. There was hooking up even then. There's always been hooking up. But um, hooking, hookup culture is new. And the difference is that whereas hooking up used to be an option that people could take advantage of, now it feels like an imperative. It's like the thing you're supposed to do in college. So if you're going to go to college and you're going to do college right, then part of what you do is engage in some kind of casual sexual activity. So that's the, the difference, where it goes from being an option to feeling like it's what everyone is supposed to be doing. So it's that idea, hookup culture is that idea, plus um, a set of practices that facilitate casual sexual encounters. So the things you all are doing that kind of make hooking up happen, and then also an institutional framework. So the things that happen at Elon that make it so that hook up, hooking up is part of the, the rhythms and the architecture of the universities. All of those things together, the idea that everyone should be hooking up, um, the practices that facilitate it, and then sort of the institutional support for it, all adds up to this hookup culture. So living in a hookup culture is very different from obeying its imperatives. <coughs> hookup culture doesn't make students do anything, and many actively and vociferously disagree with hookup culture and its rules. Many people don't participate at all. Um, in fact, a third of students will graduate from college without ever hooking up even a single time. So a lot of people are opting out, and that's really typical. That's just sort of how cultures work, right? The culture can exist, but that doesn't mean we have to like it, and it doesn't mean we have to obey it. Um, for example, it's cultural in America to only have children after you get married. But not everybody does it that way, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that if you, do it, if you do it some other way, that you get to ignore the fact that everyone thinks you did it wrong, yeah? So you're still in the culture, even if you do something different that defies it. Similarly, uh, it's cultural in America to celebrate Thanksgiving, but not all of us have the same relationship to that holiday, right? Some people feel like that hol holiday actually celebrates genocide, and if you're someone who's sensitive to that, then maybe you're quite offended by American culture, but that doesn't mean you don't live in it, right? So that's very typical. Cultures are things that exist, and we have relationships to those cultures, but we can't exactly just walk away. We can't pretend like the culture isn't there. It's the same thing with, with hookup culture. So what hookup culture tells uh, young people is that the sex that they should be having is um, sort of devoid of uh, romantic caring for one another, and perhaps any kind of care at all. We asked, uh, a set of psychologists asked students to list all of the emotions they thought their peers felt in a typical hookup, not like even an ideal one, but an actual real, real life hookups. Um, and so they could list as many emotions as they wanted. And the most common thing they listed, which, which was listed by 69% of students, was lust. That was the emotion they thought was most common in hookups, which that's, that seems good, right? <laughs> that's what you would want, um, for there to be some sort of sexual feeling for the sexual activity. Um, but then the second uh, emotion that they listed collectively, only 17% of students listed it. So there's this huge drop off in agreement about what people feel in hookups. And that second, um, that second emotion was nothing. So they said, everyone's, most, most people agreed that people were feeling lust. And then after that, nothing else. They, they assertively said, nope, just lust. So there's this notion out there that Hookups are driven by sexual desire, and that when you're in that hookup, you, you feel sexual desire for that person, but you don't necessarily feel anything else at all. Not all of the good and bad and weak and strong feelings that we could be having, not the ambivalent ones, not, not fear, not nervousness, not anxiety, um, not excitement, not, 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 certainly not love, right? And in fact, love is, is the thing that we're supposed to avoid the most in, hookup, in hookups. That is, the, that is the emotion that is most off script, this idea that you love or feel attached to that person. And that's why um, people talk about not wanting to catch feelings with someone that they're hooking up with, because that's doing it wrong. You're not supposed to actually fall for that person. 
So the idea in hookup culture is to have sex but avoid attachment. And I argue that the worst thing to be called in college today isn't um, slut, what is kind of what it used to be. It isn't really so much that anymore. Um, it's not even prude, which is a really common one. Um, the worst thing you can get called in hookup culture today is desperate or clingy. The idea that you actually want or desire a person, like for, who, for that person for who they are, and not just sort of generically in this kind of sexual, I want to be sexual kind of way. Um, being called desperate is, is, is a big slur in hookup culture. So I want to suggest that um, actually pulling this off as a community takes work, right? You can't just agree that that's what y'all are going to do. You actually have to then enact this care careless sexual activity, this sexual activity without care. You have to perform it for one another. Um, and this is, it's not automatic because, um, for, so number one, it's not automatic because students are actually having all the emotions that they're not supposed to be having. Um, all of those emotions are present in hookup culture all the time. So uh, we're, we, you are actually all having the anxiety, um, you're falling for one another, you're having um, regret, you're having all kinds of positive and negative emotions that you're not supposed to be having. And that's because you are human beings with bodies that you don't actually perfectly control. We have emotions when we have breakfast. It's just not something we can not do just because we decide not to do it. We are just literally bags of chemistry. Um, so to say we can have sex without emotions is kind of like saying we can have sex without bones. Like you just can't disengage your body from this experience. So one, we, students are actually having a lot of emotions that are off script in hookup culture. Um, another reason it's, it's actually tricky to enact this in practice is because students have to work hard to kind of um, communicate to one another that the sex is, is, is not romantic in the sense that we all know that sex is often quite romantic, right? We know that maybe even ideally sex is often quite romantic. We, we call it making love. It's the only thing we call making love. We, sex can make love out of thin air. So how do we know that in this case that's not what's happening, when so often that is what happens? What do we have to do to sort of convince one another that, that that's not what's happening? And then third, it's tricky because even though theoretically it doesn't really matter who you hook up with at a party, you're supposed to go and pick out the hottest person you can get access to and go home with that person. Um, in practice, you actually have to pick somebody, one person, and they have to pick you back. Uh, and so there's that intertwined choice whenever a hookup happens. Like I picked you when I could have picked somebody else, and you picked me when you could have picked somebody else. And that choice, um, there's some implications there. That maybe we picked each other on purpose or for some other reason than randomness. The implications of that choice have to be voided. So actually enacting meaninglessness around sexuality is a pretty uh, challenging interpersonal task. And so then hookup culture gives you a set, set of strat strategies for how to do this. Uh, so one, one, one strategy hookup culture gives you to enact meaningless um, is to suggest that you probably shouldn't hook up with the people you actually really do like, 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 right off the bat. So try to refrain from hooking up with people you quite like, um, in part because um, it, it, it's really hard to not catch feelings if you're already kind of catching feelings, right? Um, so better to hook up with someone you already know ahead of time that you're not going to fall for. Uh, one of my students about this, she said, you only pursue the people you know mean nothing to you, and you never stick around long enough to let them. Uh, a second strategy is when you have when you hook up with them, make sure that you're, you're drunk or you seem to be drunk. The people are drinking around the hookup. I, I figured this out because students would talk in these hushed tones about sober sex. Um, like sober sex was this special kind of sex um, that indicated that two people actually really liked each other. Like they were clear headed, they picked that other person on, pers on, on purpose because they liked them and they wanted to have a different kind of sexual experience. Many of my students um, who were quite sexually active had never had sex sober. It was a very, very serious thing. So. Um, about this, one of my female students said, if you're sober, it means you're both particularly attracted to each other and it's not really a one-time thing. But when drunk, you can kind of just do it because it's fun and then be able to laugh about it and have it not be awkward or mean anything. 
Uh, this is the, I think, the biggest reason why hookups are almost always ac accompanied by heavy drinking. It does act as like a social lubricant and liquid courage. It does all that stuff that we like alcohol for, right? Um, but it also sort of boxes the sexual, uh, sexual activity into the realm of meaningless. It's how we know that this, this really wasn't a thing, right? It was just kind of like a random drunken hookup. Um, a third way that students establish meaninglessness is they make sure that the hookup is hot but not warm. Remember that uh, the main thing students are supposed to be feeling in these, in these experiences is lust. So it, it's important, it's good for the hookup to be full of sort of like high intensity lust. And that could be a very, very, you know, we call them hot hookups, right? Um, but the tenderness that might be described as warmth, that stuff actually connotes liking the other person, caring about, being attentive to the other person. And that stuff is sort of threatening to a culture in which you're supposed to be having meaningless sex. So uh, once a hookup is in progress, even if you are quite nice to the person as you sort of massage that hookup out of each other, um, after that, expressions of tenderness are to be avoided. And this makes sense if you think about I think about it because um, if students accept the idea that casual sex is meaningless and emotionless, then almost by definition, anything you could do would have more meaning and be more imbued with emotion. If we've decided that sex can mean nothing, then what does it mean to hold hands? What does it mean to um, caress someone? What does it mean to uh, touch their face tenderly? All of it very potentially means more than sex because we've already decided that sex is meaningless. About holding hands, one of my students said, that little touching definitely signifies something, something a little more than just fucking. Uh, in the New York Times, uh, a journalist interviewed a couple um, men who said, male students who said that they felt that holding hands was more intimate than getting a hand job, for example. So no holding hands, no gentle kisses, no eye contact, no cuddling, no caressing, no hugs, uh, none of that sweet stuff should be involved. And in fact, if students do actually quite like one another, uh, and, and might have a romantic interest in each other, then they often delay sex, because in hookup culture, even not having sex is sometimes more meaningful than, than having sex. <laughs> Fourth, there's the rule that students act less friendly after a hookup than they did before, at least for a time. So this is when, the, after the hookup, the morning or the week after, um, suddenly the person is sort of aloof to you. It's like you did this thing the night before or the weekend before, and then suddenly they're like not quite as nice to you as they had been before, or maybe you're not quite as nice to them. Um, it's, it's as if we have to give our, our friendships a demotion after a hookup, just to like give ourselves some space between that sexual activity as sort of a reset. Nope, this didn't actually mean anything. I'm going to make sure that you know that by being a little distant from you, and you'll be a little distant from me, and everything will be clear that whatever happened, it didn't mean anything. Um, one of my students said about this, uh, being mean is the best way to handle it. And then finally, the last strategy for performing this meaninglessness, this emotionlessness, is to not hook up with the same person too many times. So you, definitely one time is safe, two times may be safe. <laughs> Three times you're starting to push this, this hookup thing into a pattern, into a habit, where you might actually be doing it because you like each other. Otherwise, why would you keep picking each other over and over again? And it starts to look like you're transitioning into something more um, romantic, like dating or then maybe a relationship. So you have to sort of cut it off uh, early on so that nobody gets the idea that anything relational is happening. To one of my students, she said, we've only hooked up once, so it automatically isn't a big deal, but twice, maybe starting to seem like a little bit of a big deal. Three times, um, four times, maybe sober, right? Um, so those are the strategies that students have, that hookup culture offers students to kind of enact this meaninglessness in, in daily life. Um, don't act warmly towards one another during the hookup. Uh, be able to say you were drunk when you did it. Um, hook up with people that you don't really like, like in that way. Uh, be less friendly after than you were before, at least for a time, and then cap your hookups at a certain limited number. Together, these strategies help ensure that everyone understands that whatever we are doing, there is no liking involved here. There's no actual liking involved here. 
um, that somehow sexual encounters aren't just careless, by which I mean unplanned and uh, unconsidered, but also that nobody is making the mistake of thinking that anybody cares about each other too much. That is hookup culture. So how did hookup culture come uh, to college campuses? Um, for this, I'm going to back up about 300 years and then speed forward to today. Um, OK, so uh, colonial era, United States. Um, so college is so boring, y'all. So boring. It, you're rigidly controlled. Church starts at 6 in the morning, and then you have like three hours of church, and then you do studying, and all the studying is like curriculum. Like, there's no classes on Harry Potter or anything like that. It is just like rigid philosophy and mathematics, and then they tell you what to eat and what to wear, and they tell you to go back to church at the end of the day, and then you go to bed and you do it the next day. College in the colonial era was kind of dreadful, kind of boring, very rigid. Nothing like we expect college to be today. At the time, most people in college were men who were from the middle class who were studying to be ministers. That's why there was so much church involved. Um, and then around mid-1700s, um, the, the elite, rich, wealthy families in the United States are trying to think about something they could do to sort of justify the hoarding of wealth and power that they're doing. And they decide that what they're going to do is make sure they have diplomas. Diplomas that sort of make them seem like they should, they should be able to hoard all that wealth and power. And so they start sending their young sons to college. And so these young, rich boys start coming to college. And um, those young men didn't have the same tolerance for boredom, for um, people that were controlling their daily lives, as did, say, uh, th these young middle class men who wanted to be ministers. So those men start rioting. And so between 1750 about and 1850 about, there's 100 years of rioting on college campuses. And by this, I don't mean like holding up signs that are cute or you know protest marches or sit-ins. I mean they all had they all had firearms. I mean, I mean, sh they would use their muskets and they would shoot out all of the all of the windows and all of the academic buildings. They would engage in arson, setting buildings on fire. They would go inside and they would throw furniture out the windows. They would. Uh, fill barrels up with tar and set them on fire and roll them across the quad. They would play their trumpets all night long and keep their professors awake, I hear. Um, it was really actually quite dangerous, these riots. And people did die. And sometimes the, the colleges would have to call in local militias. And they'd have to come in and tamp down these riots. And so at some point, all the college presidents were like, what are we going to do about all of these all this violence on college campuses. I mean, college had gone from being like relatively boring to actually kind of dangerous. And so uh, what the presidents decided to do was agree amongst one another that they would expel any student, student caught rioting and that they, they wouldn't then admit them into the other colleges. So if a student got expelled from one school, all the other presidents agreed, we won't let him into our school. And that meant that getting expelled was a very serious punishment, right? It really could end your, your higher education career. So they thought they would do that. And everyone agreed except for one guy, one college president. And this was the president of Union College in Schenectady, New York. And he said, you know what? I'll accept all of the guys <laughs> that get expelled from all the other schools. And so his school starts getting filled up with these kind of like wayward sons. Um, and it was there in 1825 that the first social fraternity was formed. <laughs> ah. Yes. So let's put the pieces together, right? So you have these, these, elite, these elite young men um, who uh, do, do not like the idea of college being boring and being controlled by the authorities, right? And so they start this social club designed to uh, make that happen. So this, these early social fraternities were all about, from the very beginning, they were all about creating a space on college campuses to have fun, a very specific kind of fun, fun that was like, reckless, just like a little bit perilous. Like they wanted to have the kind of fun um, that put you in just a little bit of danger, right? So really 
really extreme kind of fun. And um, so they wanted to do that. And they also wanted to give a middle finger to the administration, who was trying to tell them what to do and what they should be doing with their time and how they should be studying. And so fratern social fraternities from the beginning were all about like, creating this space for kind of raucous partying on college campuses. And that, and that sort of goes forward from the 1825s. The, the, the college presidents at the time were horrified by this development. They absolutely detested fraternities for a long time. And um, they, they swore they would get rid of them. And they tried really hard. Um, and they, they were unsuccessful at stopping fraternities from multiplying. And within a, a few decades, there was just hundreds and hundreds of fraternities all over the East and the South. And so. This, this multiplied, and by and about 100 years later, around 1920, 1930, when um, more and more just average middle class people started to go to college for college degrees, because college is becoming more accessible to more Americans, by that time, um, when pop culture also starts paying attention to college because so many more people are going, uh, the, frat, the frat man had, had risen to such an important position in, in the kind of collegiate imagination, that he stands out in, in the new pop cultural interest in the 1930s as like the ideal type of college student. So he becomes the model for how everyone should go to college. So he sort of brings partying to higher education in his little enclave, and then it gets democratized out to everyone. So that happens around the 1930s. Another thing that happens at that time is women start going to college. And that's the moment where fraternity men add into their sort of repertoire of what they like to do, you know, drinking and sports and petty crime. Um, they add the sexual conquest of women at that time as well. Um, two more things happen. One of them is Animal House. <laughs> um, how many of you have heard of Animal House? Yeah, it's still such a big cultural touch touchstone. So Animal House comes out in 1978, and uh, it portrays it, it, like perhaps the most famous frat men of all time, uh, or fictional frat men of all time. It, it portrays like this crazy, raucous fraternity and all of its parties, and it has this huge cultural impact. And um, in response, the alcohol companies in America decide that they're going to spend millions of dollars in the 1980s trying to convince everyone that the way to get through college is to be quite drunk much of the time. Time. So, so the alcohol companies sort of they pounce on this opportunity and they start marketing directly to you, and that's when like um, you start seeing like blow up beer cans go up at the sports events and, and all the sort of drinking specials and all that kind of stuff happening all around campuses. And by the way, next time you see an alcohol ad uh, on or around campus or in particular associated with Elon University, they're still doing it to you. Nah, they're still doing it. Um, so that happens, and the other thing that happens is the federal government, which is not paying any attention to any of this, it's just over here doing its own thing. The federal government decides that it's going gonna, it's gonna to try to push the states to raise the drinking age from 18 to 21. At the time, it's 18. And like in the late 70s after Animal House and in the early 1980s, um, there were massive parties but they were in dorms. Like the residence halls would have the keggers. They would have like huge, massive parties. Um, and so but that's because drinking age was, eight, was 18, so you, you were allowed to do that. Uh, but the federal government decides they want all the states to raise drinking age to 21. They tell the states, if you don't do this, we're going to cut all your transportation funding. And over three years, every single state complies. So between 1984 and 1987, all of the drinking ages go to 21. So what happens, what ends up happening is, um, now you get to college, you're like, I just saw Animal House, and you're ready to have your massive partying that you have like, earned the right to do, thanks to the frat guys, starting in 1825. Um, but you can no longer party in the dorms, because, you know, I mean, you can party a little bit. You can pregame in the dorms. You can't like get really w wildly drunk in the dorms, right? Um, you you have to get a fake ID to go to bars or clubs, which not everybody's into doing. It can be kind of expensive and it's a little risky and scary. Um, sororities are not allowed to throw parties with alcohol, most of them, according to Panhellenic associations. So there's really only one place left to go on a lot of campuses, campuses like Elon, where you can party the way you think a college student should, where you can party perilous, just a little bit perilously, right? We can kind of flirt with danger. And that's the fraternity house. So we have this, this, this shift back um, to fraternity men having the power to decide what social life in college sh should look like. 
In the meantime, we have the women's movement and the sexual revolution. And the women's movement, they really wanted sort of two things for women. They wanted women to have access to male spheres of life and masculinity, um, masculine traits and leisure activities and that kind of stuff. Um, but they also wanted everyone to sit up and notice that the things that women had been doing all along, the feminized parts of life, were also really valuable and that we should all be invested in doing and, and, and valuing those things too. And that second part never really happened. So what we really got was this idea that women should be able to be like men and that that maybe is what women's liberation should look like. So starting in the 1970s, right about the same time as Animal House starts coming out, um, Mothers and fathers in, in mainstream, like center cultural America, start teaching their daughters, you know, you don't have to stick to the female role. You can, you can, you can get out there and you can do anything you want to do, by which they meant you can do what boys do. You can be like boys are, right? And so we start teaching our daughters, to, and, and e not even just encouraging them and saying they can be like boys, but we never stopped valuing men and masculinity more. So it's almost like when girls started doing boyish things, we, th we thought, oh, maybe that's even better than doing girlish things. So you're raising a daughter, and you know it's cute if she likes Barbies, but you're, you think it's adorable when she likes to play with trucks, right? And um, you know it's it's nice that she wants to be on the cheerleading squad, and you'll support her. But you, but when she plays soccer, you're bragging to your friends about that, right? And when she wants to major in education, you're like, wow, I've really raised a nice, kind, kind person, right? But if she wants to major in physics, you're like, my daughter's a fucking badass, right? <laughs> right? So we start raising our daughters like this sometime in the 70s, and those daughters get to college sometimes in the, sometime in the 90s. Um, and they just apply the same logic to sexuality. They're like, the way to be cool, the way to be liberated, is to actually try to enact this kind of stereotypical male masculine sexuality. And then the, the whole thing is just set up to allow hookup culture to emerge out of that mix. I hope that makes sense. OK. Um, so a third of students say, no way. This is terrible. I hate everything about it. I want nothing to do with it. And they never hook up a single time in all of their years of college, four, five, however long it takes. Um, some of them do this for religious reasons. Some of them do this because they think, ugh, competing to find a casual sexual partner is hopeless. No one will ever pick me. There's people that feel that way. Uh, some people, a few people are in committed relationships, so they're not interested in anything with anyone else. But the most common reason students don't participate in hookup culture is because they just don't like how it goes down. It's not that they're like morally opposed to casual sex or even personally opposed to it. It's just that the way it happens around them just is very unappealing. So I had a student, for example, named Emery. He was a white heterosexual guy, kind of wafy and sensitive. He, uh, he, called it, he said he was a romantic. Um, he wanted to be a novelist. Um, and he said, referring to the hookups he saw all around him, he said, uh, I simply cannot behave that way, is what he said. Um, so the key to understanding this, this, this third of students is that even they were made unhappy by hookup culture. And, and the reason they were unhappy is because they, pray, they paid a price for opting out. Uh, one of my students, she, she most forcefully articulated th this by saying, if you do not have sex, you are not in the community. Abstainers often felt isolated from their peers. Um, they didn't go to many or any parties because the parties were so strongly tied with this sexual activity. Um, and you know, par you know, parties are where a lot of friendships get really cemented. You know, like it's it's you can go to watch movies together, have coffee or whatever. But when you hold someone's hair back once or twice, right? <laughs> that's when you know. That's that's when you know you're really friends, right? Um, the abstainers often felt excluded from the conversation about hooking up. Remember, there's not, a, there's not that much hooking up going on, but there is a lot of talking about it. And if they had nothing to add, um, then, then they often felt like they just couldn't talk to their peers very much. They, shall, they felt judged by their peers for not doing it, but they also felt that their peers felt judged by them. So there's this kind of like boundary, this, this seeming moral boundary between the people that were and weren't, were and, and weren't opting in or out. And so a lot of these students became isolated. Um, one of my students, her, na her name is Jasleen. 
She said that she felt like she was missing out on the whole college experience because she was abstaining. She said, as much as I hate admitting it to myself, I feel incredibly left out because all my friends want to do is hook up and are hooking up with other people, but all I can do is watch her go back to the dorm. Now, Jasleen was a God-fearing African-American woman from a humble class background who identified as a lesbian, so I was not the slightest bit surprised that she wasn't into hookup culture because every one of those characteristics suggests that she would be less interested in hookup culture than her counterparts. Um, in fact, that's what we find. We find that any social hierarchy you can imagine, whether it's disability or attractiveness or cis versus transgenderedness or um, race or class, um, gender for sure, sexual orientation as well, all of those hierarchies, it's the people at the top of those hierarchies that tend to enjoy hooking up and actually participate in hookup culture more than the people who are um, in the middle and at the bottom of those hierarchies. So hookup culture tends to be most powerfully endorsed by and participated in by the people who are most privileged on campus. Jasleen just put it straight up. She said hooking up is not for black people. Uh, that's how she felt. Um, so uh, we, have, we have really good evidence that the people that like it the most uh, tend to be the, the most privileged on campus and the people that like it the least, on average, all things being equal, less privileged. About a quarter of students, like I said, um, are very enthusiastic about hookup culture. They genuinely love it. And it, as far as all the data suggests, um, it, it's true. Um, we know that it, if you're a person who says, I really love and enjoy all the casual sexual opportunities I have on college campuses, I wouldn't have it any other way, then probably the more you hook up, the higher your self-esteem, the higher your well-being. For the people that like it, it really, really works. Um, for the rest of the students, the ones that are neither abstaining and, and neither are they fully enthusiastic about it, um, these sort of ambivalent participators, it's about 40, 45% of students, um, they were out there encountering people, having hookups, but not always feeling really great about it. And I wanna um, turn to talking about what about hookup culture, this particular hookup culture that we see on college campuses, um, is causing students to report uh, distress and, and, and frustration. So one is this, this emotional landscape. It's this idea that you're supposed to be having casual sex, but you're not actually supposed to be ha liking the other person at all, or being careful or, 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 or caring about that other person. Um, it can feel bad to have to suppress emotions that you're actually having. Whether they're positive or negative, it can feel bad to not be allowed to have them. Uh, it can feel bad to think that everyone else can easily control their emotions around sexuality, but you can't, that there might be something wrong with you. It can, be, it can feel bad to be treated in an unfriendly way, because you're not supposed to be friendly towards the people you are hooking up with. You're just supposed to like get in, get out, be done. Um, and it, it, felt a lot, it felt bad for a lot of students to actually be unfriendly, to, to, to treat people dismissively after being friends with them before. That often felt bad as well. And you know, it's one thing to have casual sexual encounters with someone that you, um, you, you know doesn't love you, right? But it's like entirely another one to have casual sexual encounters with someone who may not like you at all. And sometimes it can be hard to tell the difference in hookup culture. You know, sex with someone who has benevolence towards you, even if they don't love you, can feel good. But when you don't even know if they like you at all, when it's perfectly possible that they actively don't like you, that can feel kind of bad. And then functionally, this, this rule that you not like, you not be into your partner, um, is a downward spiral because the whole point is to like them less than they like you. Because if you like them more than they like you, then you're the desperate half, right? So you, nobody wants to be the desperate half. So it becomes this downward spiral where like everyone's backing up emotionally um, further and further and further apart until you're, you're actually being quite, quite um, aloof in a way that's uncomfortable. Sometimes students played this game so hard that they broke their own hearts. I had this student named Farah, and she was hooking up with this guy named Teek, and Farah was really good at hookup culture. She could play this game beautifully. She enjoyed it. Um, and so she started hooking up with Teek, but then she started to actually start to like him. 
And then they do that dance that people do, you know, where they like hook up and then they pretend like they don't care. And then they're like, what's going on? And they hook up again. And they like pretend like they don't care. And like, what's going on? Nobody knows what's going on. They hook up again. And, and everyone's like all sort of full of nervousness about what's happening. So um, she's writing in her diary, you know, for, for weeks about this guy and how she's increasingly liking him and continuing to hook up with him. They don't, they don't act like they like each other and what's going on. So finally, um, Teak does something really brave, and he asks her to meet him. And he says, he actually texts her, I'm sorry I've been such a dick. You know, can we talk? And so she's like, whatever, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and then she meets him, and they sit down on a curb outside of her, um, outside of her dorm room. And they like, do a little bit of small talk for a second. And then he says, so do you like like me? And they've had sex at this time like four or five times. And um, she looks him straight in the eye and says no. Because, yeah, she's, she's just, she's so, she's so practiced at pretending not to care. She's so in the habit of like hiding her emotions. And she's so, like actually ha expressing those kinds of feelings is so off script. And it's, it's so often made fun of in hookup culture, she just can't do it. She just can't tell him. And she says she just sat there on the curb, and then they went back to talking about whatever they were talking about before, and felt like this just sadness like spread from the middle of her <laughs> chest. And she never hooked up again. She was that sort of, that did. She just broke her own heart. Like, she, that was enough for her. Um, so this game of pretending like you don't like one another can really, um, can really, can really add up to some pretty traumatic and uncomfortable and sad experiences. So that's one reason that students often don't really like hookup, hookup culture as much as they thought they might. Um, another is because if you're not supposed to be picking someone to hook up with based on how much you like them as a person, then what's your rationale? Like, what's your criteria for, how, for whether to hook up with them? And in hookup culture, if you're doing it right, uh, the criteria is status. Like, how much would your friends want to hook up with that person? Right? It's like, how, how much social status does this person have? Will other people be jealous or impressed if I hook up with that person? That's the kind of cri the, the, the criteria, the economy that's going on. And so um, when that's happening, of course, that itself is incredibly intimidating, right? Because you know people are judging you that way, too. Right? So that often can feel just really intimidating. But um, it also allows all kinds of really ugly biases to sneak in. So if it's social status and, and what everybody else thinks about the person that, that gives us our rationale for hooking up with them, then that allows for um, racism and colorism to sneak into this, these calculations. It allows for sizism and fat phobia and markers of social class and issues of disability or the denigration of people who are considered unattractive or anyone who defies gender expectations, really. So what ends up happening is we're, we're working in this erotic marketplace that is full of all of America's like worst prejudices. And, and people who are, um, who, who are biased against in that system they're not, they know this, right? This is not something that is difficult to tell. And so that does not necessarily feel very good. For women, this is particularly intense when it comes to the judging of their physical bodies. Um, one of my students said, we feel that if we have any flaws, that men will consider us ugly. Women need to be absolutely perfect physically, perfect hair, skin, weight, height, and so on. This wasn't just something students were absorbing from a lifetime of television and movies and web series and books and magazines and newspapers and advertisements and billboards and commercials, internet surfing, video games, music, and all those other things that we encounter every day. Um, it was also something that they were absorbing from the people around them. So for example, one of my students talked about working in a computer lab. She was trying to do her homework and there's some guys kind of around the corner. Um, and they're flipping through some sort of Google image search of some model or celebrity and they're, they're drooling over her. And so, you know, oh, look how hot she is. Oh. And um, they're doing this and that is intimidating enough for her, right? But then apparently they flipped to a, another picture of the same girl. And one of the guys says, but look, oh my god. And he says it with disgust. 
And she's, she's sitting at her computer lab going like, what exactly could have happened to this person? That she went from being like so hot to being totally disgusting in like one picture. She's, she's just like, what could have possibly have happened? She wrote, um, was she in an accident? <laughs> like, did she get a tan? Did she gain some weight? Did she cut her hair? Did she change her style? She said, there are so many things a girl can do that can sabotage her beauty. And so there was just incredible amounts of, pres of pressure on women to try to, to give um, this mythical, if women wanted to sleep with men, this, this mythical, stereotypical um, heterosexual man, the body that he presumably demanded, this absolutely perfect body. And it, it did make women um, pliable in a way that they wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, the journalist Naomi Wolf once wrote very shrewdly, she said, a quietly mad population is a tractable one. So women were kind of made mad by all of these expectations and, and made so insecure that sometimes um, men could get away with pretty bad behavior. For heterosexual men, uh, this competitive status feature of hookup culture took on a different kind of sinisterness. Um, Men who, who want to play the game well, and not all men care to play the hookup culture game at all, but for the men who really want to play it well, who are really invested in hooking up, um, they're buffeted by two contrast, contrasting uh, imperatives. One is hook up all the time, right? Constantly, all the time, never go home without hooking up. The other one is only hook up with women my guy friends will think are, imp like, are impressive to have gotten, right? So high status women. So um, then they had to sort of like manage these contrasting experiences because presumably you couldn't hook up with like the hottest, most elusive woman every single night. So how do you hook up every single night but always hook up with, with the women your guy friends will be, like, will be impressed by? So one of my students, Corey, he's in one of these kind of guy friendship groups that is really super invested in this. Um, and his friend Simon comes in one morning and sort of sheepishly announces, this is Saturday morning, that he'd hooked up with this one girl that he knows that his friends think is ugly. And um, Corey watches as Simon just gets ribbed for this. Like, so his guy friends are like, oh, she's such a dog, she's so gross, that's so gross, why'd you do that, right? And they're teasing and they're joking, but they mean it. And so Simon's like, I know, I know, you're right. We don't know if he really thought she was ugly or not. But he kind of tried to save some face by saying, yeah, yeah, she's ugly. So then the next night, they all go out again. This is Saturday night. Um, and this time, Simon manages to hook up with a girl that he knows his friends thinks is hot. And so the next morning, he comes in. He's like, oh, high fives all around. You hooked up with this hot girl. Congratulations, we approve, right? Um, and then Simon goes off to do something else, and Corey, my student, stays in the room, and they all start talking about whether or not this second girl, the hot girl, was easy. Because if she was easy, then that doesn't count either, because it doesn't take any game to get her. If it's all about having game, and like getting something you're not really supposed to get, talking women into giving you this sexual access, if that's what makes you impressive as a man in front of other men's eyes, then it doesn't count if she's easy, because it didn't take any space. There was nothing special about you that was necessary for her to give it up, right? So it doesn't count if she's ugly, because supposedly she's desperate. It doesn't count if she's easy, because anybody could get her. Doesn't mean, it means you don't have, you don't have game. Um, it doesn't count if you've had sex with her before, because she's already given up to you once, so that a second time doesn't count for anything. And they're counting, right? And so Corey was like, this is terrible. <laughs> Corey called it a hostile environment. He's like, I feel so much pressure from these guys to hook up all the time, but I can't always be hooking up with women that they approve of, and so I'm always getting ribbed by these people, and it's a really unpleasant experience. So that's happening alongside um, women feeling really insecure because of the status part, men trying to imp impress the, uh, the men in their friendship groups. I know that, like, we're supposed to tell young men, like, don't care what your friends think so much, right? And, like, don't be so invested in masculinity. But let's be honest, right? Men's ability to impress other men is, is an incredibly important skill in American culture. And they're figuring out how to do this in high school and in college. These are going to be the men that are going to be the gatekeepers to good jobs, right? They're going to be the men you need to socialize with in, in order to get promotions and raises, right? It, this is important for guys to do. So I really do feel for them. 
Um, another thing that's going on in hookup culture that is causing um, some people to be unhappy is the orgasm gap. Um, so here's, here's a piece of good news. We have been measuring the rate at which men and women who sleep with each other have orgasms since the 1950s. And your orgasm gap in relationships is the smallest gap I have ever seen on record for any population except for gay people, um, <laughs> ever. So good job. You're, <laughs> you are doing something that your parents couldn't do and your grandparents couldn't do. Like, <laughs> yeah, you should be. You should be happy about this. <coughs> but your orgasm gap in hookups, exactly the same. That is, uh, women are having one orgasm for every three orgasms that men have. This is even true when both people perform oral sex on one another. When women perform oral sex on men, they do so with just gusto, you know? <laughs> We're gonna do this, you know? Mm. Not as much gusto in the other direction. So um, when it turns out, if you sit down with, with, with men who are hooking up with women, and you ask them, do you care about women's orgasms, a lot of these men will say, oh, I care about my girlfriend's orgasms a lot. But a hookup, nah, I don't really care about that. Whereas women feel, they feel, tend to feel that their male partners' orgasms are important no matter what, whether it's a hookup or not. So there's this real asymmetry in whose orgasms are valued. And this was really put in stark perspective when I had a bisexual student who said um, that he prioritized his partner's orgasm when he hooked up with a guy, but he prioritized his, his own orgasm when he hooked up with a woman. And he was like, oh my god, that's terrible. OK, so one of the ways in which um, men like Corey and Simon sort of managed um, this, 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 co this contrasting uh, demands on them to hook up all the time, but only with high status women, was when the only, one, the only person they could get to hook up with them at the end of the, of the night was someone that they knew that their friends would look down on, they saved face by treating them badly. And one of the ways they treated them badly was by withholding orgasm or being crude or rude or pushy in sex. So if you knew that your friends were gonna be like, oh, she's a dog, oh, she was a slut, if you could go back to your friends and say like, oh, I know you, I know you think she's shit, but you should have seen what I did to her, then they could save some face. So a lot, so it's not that by any stretch of the imagination, all men are treating women badly in hookups, but there's a certain slice of men who are particularly active in hookup culture, who do treat women badly, and they're doing it on purpose. And it doesn't take all that many encounters with men like that, or women like that, for that matter, for people to um, stop having a good time. And so, of course, on top of everything, um, we have this problem of sexual assault and coercion. If you have a culture where it's already OK to not care about the other person you're having sexual encounters with, if you're not supposed to be attentive and, and, and really be, be worried about consent and really wanting that other person to be there and be having a good time and having pleasure, if that's not what you're there for, if you're just supposed to get in there and get yours, right? then you're already pushing, um, you're backing away from kind of kind, consensual, pleasurable experiences. And when, when you're trying to back away from seeming like you care too much, you can back right up into being callous, you can back right up into being cruel to one another, and those things can really feel like they're perfectly reasonable. If that other person isn't supposed to like you, then if they treat you badly, it's your fault if you feel bad, right? Because you're not supposed to care about them either. You're just in it for the sex, right? And so then it's acceptable for people to be rude and mean to one another in sexual encounters, and people who are, are, are on the receiving end of that don't feel entitled to any sort of um, recompense for that or, or apology for that. And so when that's in place, then suddenly it's really easy to see how sexual assault could become part of that mix and not necessarily seem obviously bad, right? If it's okay to be an asshole, then that's getting real close to being a criminal, right? And when, once we accept asshole behavior, then that line starts to get real easy to trip over. So then what happens is when we have actual like active predators, um, Hookup culture acts as a camouflage. It, it makes it hard to see the people who are really purposefully exploiting their peers. And it also acts as a catalyst. When you enter into a rape facilitating environment, sometimes one of the risks of being in that space is having a rape facilitated that you actually per perpetrate. 
So when you're in, when you're in a rape facilitating environment, then people that would in other environments never do anything like this might find themselves obeying the rules of hookup culture, which look a heck of a, are getting a heck of a lot, um, getting pretty close to looking like sexual assault. And so it catalyzes um, aggressive and criminal sexual behavior as well as um, camouflaging it. Okay. So this is why hookup culture only pleases a minority of students. It's why it mostly pleases students that are at the apex of the social hierarchies on campus. It's why so many students just opt out altogether, um, even though they would mostly be rather, they'd be, rather be having sex as well. Um, it's why so many students who do participate do so ambivalently and often change their minds altogether, like Owen. Um, if students are going to actually have the positive, free, liberated sexual experience that, they, that most students want when they come to college, then we need to actually change the culture such that that's possible. And the thing about cultures is that they are actually incredibly difficult and incredibly easy to change. They're really difficult in that um, it, cultures are like bigger than the sum of their parts, right? They kind of exist in our heads all collectively, individually, but then like they, they're, they're bigger than us. So we as individuals can say like, but I don't want it to be that way, but you can't, it's too bad, right? Um, so it takes a whole critical mass of people to change their minds at the same time for culture to change. But if you can get that to happen, then the culture literally just goes away. Uh, if everyone just changes their minds at once, it's gone. It doesn't live except in us. So in that sense, there's a, there's a lot of power to change culture if we can just get organized to make it happen. Um, I know that students can think up something better because I listened to them really, really carefully. And they're, y'all are bright and insightful and, you, and visionary and I know that y'all can think of something better and I, and I really am interested to see what you come up with. I, I'll tell you what I would like. Um, one is I'd love it if um, hookup culture competed with different kinds of sexual cultures on college campuses. So I'd love to see room for traditional dating um, where romance and sex kind of go hand in hand. I would love to see room for more, um, more conservative religious ideas, for queer spaces, for polyamorous and open relationships. I would just love to see sort of the hookup bubble shrinking and all kinds of other bubbles opening up. And I'd also like to see that I'd like to see the hookup culture that is left to be a little bit kinder, to be not so much about status, but actually about joining together and caring about one another, even if just for you know five minutes. Um, we are casually kind all the time. You know, um, you are at the cash when you cash out at, at the Walgreens. You can be casually kind when you super pregnant lady drop something at the on the floor of the grocery store, you're like, let me get that for you, right? Casually kind. We are casually kind all the time, and we can have a sexual culture that is both casual and kind at the same time. So I would love to see that. Whatever it is that students want, um, we need institutional support for that as well, right? So one thing that colleges need to do is they need to um, take the power out of the hands of the most privileged students on campus and reorganize the institution so that it's not just the fraternity houses that have so much power to offer social life to college students. Um, so the, the, the campuses really need to make more room for all of your voices to be equally heard. Um, so I would love to see these changes and I would honestly, I would love it, I would love it if you could fix this for us because my generation we didn't fix the problems. We created some new ones. We, we didn't fix the, all the problems that our previous generation sort of gave, gave to us. Um, so I kind of feel like I'm excited about what you bring because the problems of sex on college campuses are the same problems we see across all of American culture. We all face this onslaught of sexualized messages designed to make us worry that our sex lives are inadequate. Um, there's this obsession with status and an erotic marketplace uh, off campus too, one that's distorted by prejudice. Uh, there's orgasm gap all, all throughout America. Um, and sexual violence is epidemic everywhere. So I'm really hoping that you all come up with a vision and are emboldened to make it reality because we're counting on you. Thank you so much.